<clears throat> In this video, we're going to go over Hess's law. So what Hess's law says is the enthalpy change of a reaction is independent of the chemical route it takes from reactant to products. Okay, so let's break that down a bit and uh, make that a little bit easier to understand. So what that basically says is, let's say we have a reaction, R to P, where R is the reactant and P is the product, right? And this has an enthalpy change, uh, which we denote as delta H1 of 10 kilojoules per mole. So what this says is that the overall enthalpy change is going to be the same whether R is converted directly to P, or if there's an alternate route for R to be converted to P, uh, such as this one shown in green, where R is first converted to A uh, by uh, with an enthalpy change of delta HRA of five kilojoules per mole, and then A is converted to B with an enthalpy change delta HAB of negative 20 kilojoules per mole, followed by a conversion of B to P, uh, with an enthalpy change of delta HBP equals 25 kilojoules per mole. So what this is, is just is just an alternative path uh, to get to the same place from R to P. And so the Hess's law says that the overall enthalpy changes should be uh, equivalent. And so we can see this a little bit clearer if we uh, take a look, if we uh, write the reactions out. So R to A, and then we have the corresponding enthalpy changes right next to them, A to B and B to P. So if we want the overall balanced reaction of this, right, what the first thing we're going to do is we're going to cross out uh, intermediates, uh, which are molecules uh, or species uh, that are the products of one reaction and become the reactants of a second reaction, right? So for instance, A is going to get crossed out and B is going to get crossed out. And all that's left on the reactant side is R, and all that's left on the product side is P, all right, for an overall uh, reaction stoichiometry of R to P. So now we know that we're going from R to P, uh, just like in the original reaction shown uh, in black on the bottom here. So we can just add our uh, enthalpy changes for each reaction step. 5 minus 20 plus 25, and that's going to be equal to 10 kilojoules per mole, which is exactly what we get for delta H1 uh, when R is converted directly to P. Uh, and so that's an illustration of how Hess's law works. So you can either get the, uh, the enthalpy change in this case, uh, either by calculating or directly measuring the enthalpy change uh, for conversion of R directly to P, or if you have, for some reason, the uh, enthalpy changes for R to A, A to B, and B to P, then that's an alternative way that you can get these enthalpy changes. Right? And so this doesn't just apply to enthalpy. Um, this also applies to other state functions. Okay, And so that's the definition of a state function, right, is that it's a value that is, that is path independent. Okay, The value only depends on where you start and where you finish, all right? And so state functions that are important for this, uh, that we'll talk a lot, a lot in this class will be uh, enthalpy, uh, change in entropy, delta S, uh, change in free energy, delta G, and then reduction potentials. Okay. So how can we use this to our advantage? So this is uh, the glycolysis pathway, don't worry about it taking this all in. Uh, the important part is this is a 10-step pathway. Um, this is a pretty well-known pathway uh, for the breakdown of glucose uh, to pyruvate. And so there are 10 steps here. Uh, glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, which converts to fructose 6-phosphate, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay. And so we're going to make this a little bit easier to digest schematically okay, for the purposes of this, of this demonstration. Okay. And so these are just the uh, various steps of the uh, glycolysis pathway. All right, so at the beginning, glucose is converted. Uh, in the top here, glucose is converted to two molecules of two G uh, or two molecules of GAP, and then each molecule of GAP is converted to pyruvate. Okay. 
right? So that's important to remember that stoichiometry there. All right, so let's take the free energy changes. So we're going to put the free energy changes down here underneath each step. All right, they're going to be shown in green. So these are uh, the delta G, uh, not prime values for, uh, and these are biological uh, standard Gibbs free energy uh, in kilojoules per mole. So, for instance, the first step has a uh, delta uh, biological uh, standard free energy of negative 18.4 kilojoules per mole, and then the rest are shown uh, below each of their steps. Okay, and so what we can do then is if we're trying to answer the question, what is the overall free energy change for glycolysis? Um, where this is the overall reaction stoichiometry uh, down here shown in black. Uh, what we can do is we can just add the uh, delta G values for each of the steps and come up with this. All right? So we have to remember, though, that on the bottom uh, row, these steps happen twice because there are two molecules of GAP. So two so this uh, basically the steps in the bottom row happen twice. So we have to multiply each of these uh, free energy changes by two. And so now we add all these up. So delta G overall uh, glycolysis is going to be equal to negative 18.4 plus 1.7 minus 15.9 plus 23.9 plus 7.6. So those are the free energy changes in the upper row. And in the bottom row, that happens twice. It's going to be 2 times 6.3 plus 2 times negative 17.2 plus 2 times 4.4 plus 2 times negative 3.2 plus 2 times negative 29.7 for an overall free energy change of negative 79.9 kilojoules per mole. Okay. So that's what we get calculated. So that's under... Uh, that's under standard biological conditions, so negative 79.9 kilojoules per mole. But in a cell, this can go to negative 102.9 kilojoules per mole. So it's a more negative number, which means this is a more favorable pathway thermodynamically uh, than we calculate under standard conditions. So why might that be? And that's something we're going to uh, discuss uh, later on uh, as you... Uh, continue through the video sequence. Okay, so as you look at the future, as you look at the videos going on in module one, uh, try to think about these questions. So, how does Gibbs free energy predict if a reaction is a reactant or product favored? What's the difference between delta G, delta G naught, and delta G naught primed? How do enthalpic and entropic terms influence Gibbs free energy? How can temperature or reactant and product concentrations influence the equilibrium of the reaction? And how do we get Gibbs free energy for electron transfer reactions? And